Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the Gospel of Luke. We're picking up chapter 16 tonight. We had that beautiful parable of the prodigal son in chapter 15. Remember, prodigal means that English word was not used in that chapter, but it, that basically comes from verse 13. And prodigal means just to live to excess, to waste. And that, that man, he just went completely the way of no morals, of vices, and just completely went astray from living according to God's way. And he lost everything. And so he, he came to, he was working for someone else. He was wishing he could even eat what the pigs were eating. So he went back to his father, just not even wanting to be an heir anymore. He just wanted to be a servant. But when he came, his father saw him and his father ran to him. And he said, uh, the, the man said to his father, just how I've sinned against heaven. I'm no more worthy to, to be here. But then what did the father do? He said, bring the best robe. Put a ring on his hand. Put the shoes on his feet. Let's kill the fatted calf and let's make merry. Let's rejoice because my son, which was lost, is now found. And that's how it is when you, no matter what you've done, if you repent and you return to our Heavenly Father, your sins are erased as if they never existed. And God doesn't say, oh, because you committed all these sins, you, you have to be low now. No, He says, bring the best robe. And you are rewarded and even the angels in heaven rejoice. There's joy in the presence of the angels in heaven when even one repents and comes to the salvation through Jesus Christ. Now in today's chapter, we're going to read about what happens when you die. And you see, it's, it's not some big mystery. I mean, people search their whole life, oh, well, what happens after death? All they'd have to do is read the word of God. And so, and we have another parable that even leads up to that that's very important. So this chapter 16, a very important chapter that will give comfort to many people as the Word of God always does. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your Word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. So, all right, we pick it up Luke chapter 16, verse 1, and it reads, And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. This steward, he, he was ripping his master off. And that was brought to the master's attention, to the rich man's attention. Verse 2. And he called him and said unto him, the master saying to the steward, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me my stewardship. I cannot dig, in the Greek that he says, I am not strong enough to dig. To beg, I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. He's got an idea. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. What he's about to do, he's going to go to the people who owe his master money, and uh, he's going to get a plan so hopefully one of them will bring him into their house. But he's certainly not going to do anything righteous at all. Watch what he does. Verse 5. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. So now he's going to rip off his Lord of, of half of what he's actually owed. But he's hoping by giving these debtors a break, he's hoping that they will bring him into their house after he's fired from being the steward of, this, of the rich man. Verse 7, Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. Verse, and fourscore, that's eighty. 
verse 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Yeah, but what type of wisdom did he use? Certainly not God's wisdom. He used the wisdom of this world, which is only going to destroy you. It might do you good seemingly for at the short term, but definitely not the long term. Make a note of Romans chapter 16, verse 19. It says, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. It's not good to have a whole lot of wisdom on how to rip people off. And make no mistake, when it said the Lord commended the unjust steward, that's not our heavenly father, Lord. It's the rich man. So, he, so he, even though he got ripped off, he was like, hey, you kind of got the best of me. You know, that was pretty wild. That was pretty smooth of you. But was God happy with it? Absolutely not. And of course, it, when you just build up treasures on earth, those are treasures that moth and rust that can corrupt and that people can break through and steal. Who cares about earthly treasures? But treasures in heaven, if you do things God's way, those are forever. Verse 9. And I wanted to mention 2 Timothy 4.10 where Demas, he was a faithful servant of God who served with Paul for some time. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says that Demas, because he loved this present world, he forsook Paul. I mean, right there with the Apostle Paul, with such an incredible teacher. But he got caught up in the ways of the world and he forsook Paul. So do not let the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this world cause you to turn away from serving God and doing things God's way. Verse 9, And I say unto you, Make to, yourselves friends of the make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive un into you everlasting habitations. But if all you're doing is ripping people off and getting unrighteous mammon, you think that's the everlasting habitation you want to go to? Of course not. Mammon, it literally means wealth, and so it means greed, avarice. And let's go another verse, verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Make a note of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1 on your own. So you can't just say, oh, well, I'm going to commit these couple of sins. That's okay. No, it's not okay. Yes, we all sin at times because we make mistakes. But it would be a terrible thing for you to just say, oh, well, I'm just going to keep committing this sin. No, you can't do that. He that is unjust in least is unjust in much. And same with the other way. He's the faithful in least is faithful in much. Verse 11. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you're not even going to, even in the unrighteous mammon you get, if you can't even deal with that honestly, then you think you're going to get things that, you think you're going to get true blessings from God? You think you're going to get true rewards? Of course not. And of course, that's what the true riches are, is wisdom. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 11, Wisdom is more precious than rubies, and there's nothing desired that can be compared to it, to wisdom. Verse 12, And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you cannot serve wealth. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Of course, you have to work. You have to provide for yourself and your family. If you don't, then you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel, as it's written in Timothy. But you don't put getting money number one in your life. You don't serve that. You can't serve two masters. You only serve the true master, our Heavenly Father. And you always put God in His Word first. Verse 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. That means they turned their nose up at him. Verse 15, And he said unto them, 
Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is, a, is an abomination in the sight of God. Things that people really get jealous of of other people. If it's wickedness, it's an abomination. If it's unnatural, if it's lustful, it's an abomination. You stay away from it. Some people might think, oh, look, look at what they got. I'm so jealous. Well, you better not be if it's, uh, if it's unrighteous mammon, if it's wickedness. Because everyone gets what they deserve in the end, good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. But the beauty of serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that if you repent, your sins are washed away as if they never existed and they're not laid to your charge. So praise God for that. Know with your hearts that the exact Greek word that I'm about to mention isn't used here. But cardionastes is used in Acts chapter 1, verse 24, and Acts chapter 15, verse 8. And it means the heart knower. And God is the heart knower. And how comforting is that? That even though when you do mess up, if you're truly trying to serve God, He knows that. And you'll be rewarded for that. Just repent when you sin. It's washed away if you're sincere in repentance. But if you claim to be super holy, and you, it might seem to other people like you're real holy, but in your mind you're just doing it to be praised of men, and God knows that, and you got wrath coming. Matthew chapter 6 talks all about how they make long, vain prayers in the sight of men, and they love to be called rabbi, they love chief seats in the rooms. But it says if you're doing all these things to be seen of men, you have your reward. But it says when you do alms, when you help others and things like that, you do it secretly and God will reward you openly. Verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John, that's speaking of John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist, six months older than his cousin, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he was the forerunner. He paved the way for the coming of Messiah, the first advent, Jesus Christ. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. That means, I mean, people are just striving to get in. I mean, that repentance was taught, that salvation was taught, that you just have to believe on Jesus Christ, and you have eternal life. That is something to press into. That's something to get excited about. Verse 17, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass, then one tittle of the law to fail. The law is not done away with. What was done away with? You read about it in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. The ordinances. That means the blood sacrifices, the ceremonies, and the rituals. That was all nailed to the cross. But the morals of the law, those stay the same. But also, what do you read in, in the book of James? I can't remember the chapter, maybe about chapter 2, verse 14 or something like that. But it says, mercy rejoiceth over judgment. And you see, in, in the law, there were some pretty harsh judgments. Many things, it, it was caused for you to be stoned to death and things like that. But do you remember in John chapter 8, where the woman was brought to Jesus and there were some that were trying to get him to say that she should be stoned to death. And they were really just tempting him, trying to, as their main objective. But you remember what Christ did? He started writing down in the sand. It's not written exactly what he wrote, but I think it's a 99.9% .9 chance he was writing what their sins were. Because right after that, they ran away. And then Christ said to the woman, where are thine accusers? They're all gone. They ran away. He said, who has condemned thee? And then she didn't see anyone. They were all gone. And then Christ said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Any sin she committed, if she repented, they were erased as if they never even existed. And don't let anyone ever try to hold some sin over you. If, it, if you repent of it, it doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. And only a holier-than-thou hypocrite would try to hold something against you that you've already repented for. That's the exact opposite of what a Christian should do. Verse 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. 
And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Now we go into the parable. Now we're going to find out exactly what happens when your flesh body dies. And uh, so let's get into it. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That means he lived luxuriously. Verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The dogs were being more compassionate to Lazarus than the rich man was. Verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died also and was buried. If you read many different places what happens when you die. What's it say here? He was carried up into Abraham's bosom by the angels. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7 makes it very clear. When your flesh body dies, your flesh returns to dirt. And your spirit returns to God who gave it. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, Paul makes it very clear that if he were to depart from this flesh body, he'd be with Christ. And now we're going to see in this chapter that everyone when they die, that they, they return to God, but there's a gulf. If you pass the test on earth, if you believed on Jesus Christ and passed the test, you go to the good side where Lazarus is and where Abraham is, where Isaac and Jacob are and all the servants of God. But if you don't pass the test like this rich man who only cared about ways of this world, didn't believe on Jesus Christ, then you go to the other side of the gulf. Let's find out what that other side of the gulf is like. Verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes. This is speaking of the rich man. Being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So he could even see him on the other side of that gulf. I mean, how miserable would that be to know that you could have been over there if you would have just served God, but you chose ways of the world instead. Then you got to sit over there on that wrong side of the gulf. But just hold on. Verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Check out that word tormented in the Greek. Odunio, and it means grieved. It's translated in other places in the English as sorrow. So when you go on that wrong side of the gulf, understand this isn't a literal flame. He's in a spiritual body, first of all, as everyone is when they, when they return to the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 makes it clear we have two bodies. So it's not like he's in a literal flame. No, he's in torment. He's in grief. He's in sorrow. And what's the water he needs? The living water. Jesus Christ, the one who gives comfort. So and the, why, does God, why does God do it this way? Puts him on the other side of the gulf. Where if, if you're a student of Revelation chapter 20, you know that when the true Christ returns to earth at the seventh trumpet, that's when the thousand year teaching period will begin. And all those who are on the wrong side of the gulf, they will have the opportunity for salvation in that thousand year teaching period. They will see Christ. They will have no hang ups of the flesh because they're in a spiritual body. And Satan will be cast into the pit for that thousand years. But you see, you learn in Revelation 20, if they follow Satan at the end of the thousand years, they will die the second death and then their soul will perish. But so you see, when they go to the wrong side of the gulf, they feel this incredible shame. God makes sure they feel that shame so they don't follow Satan at the end of the millennium. It's to teach them. It's to correct them. And God corrects those he loves. Hebrews chapter 12. So God does this with love. Once again, it's not, he's not actually burning in a fiery flame. No, he's in torment and grief. So he will not, so he feels this shame. So he won't follow Satan at the end of the millennium. Now that is merciful by our Heavenly Father. No one who has ever been born in a flesh body is condemned right now. Only Satan and the fallen angels are condemned to the second death. But it's because of what they did in a spiritual body. 
That's why everyone will have the opportunity in that thousand year teaching period in a spiritual body. But make sure that you don't go to the wrong side of the gulf in the first place. You find out in Revelation 20, if you stand against the false Christ, you will be a priest and reign with Christ through that thousand years. Make sure you get to the right side by believing on Jesus Christ and you can be there with Lazarus and Abraham and all those who love God. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Don't ever forget Romans chapter 8, verse 18, where it says, The sufferings of this present time are not compared to the glory that will be revealed in you. So you get through these hard times. I'm going to mention three other verses you can check out on your own. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. You want some excellent comfort? Check out those verses. Verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So if that word gulf, a medical term, Luke being the doctor, it means a chasm, an opening. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So everyone right now is in heaven with God. They're either on one side of the gulf or the other. And no one can pass that gulf. You know, I, th I think apparently some people are being taught that that people can go over to the, rock, to the other side of the gulf and teach them or something like that? Well, that's a 100% lie. Don't ever let... And I say that because of things that people have said to me. And It's like, where are people getting this from? Do they not stick to God's word? No one can cross that gulf. They're just in suffering torment on that wrong side of the gulf. And they will all be taught in the millennium. Because some, some people try to say that people who have already lived and died, they say, people, they say they don't get a chance in the millennium. That's a lie. That's a one million percent lie. People, I don't know where this is coming from, but people are being taught that only people who are alive at the end, who worship Satan as the false Christ, or they, they teach only they have a chance in the millennium. They're Satan worshipers. There's, they are still going to have an opportunity in the millennium, but so is everybody else. And I'm, I'm speaking of those at the end of when Satan will arrive and he will be disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. Many people will be deceived and worship him because they will think he actually is Christ. But God is so merciful that even they have an opportunity for repentance. But make no mistake, don't be misled. Every single person who has ever been born a flesh body, they will have the opportunity for salvation in the millennium if they're on the wrong side of the gulf. But once again, you make sure you get to the right side of the gulf by believing on the Savior, Jesus Christ. The only pe Then, at the end of the millennium, if they follow the devil, then they will die the second death. Then their soul will perish. But God gives every last opportunity that's how merciful he is and how loving he is. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. That's what he wishes would happen, but he does give free will. And if they follow Satan at the end of the thousand years, good riddance. They're truly evil. They would never repent and finally will be rid of them and will go into the eternity of Revelation chapter 21 and 22 where there's no sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more tears. Verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. And you see, this rich man, he obviously has compassion. He's hoping that at least his family would be converted so you think he's going to be saved in the millennium? I sure think so. I sure I hope you wouldn't judge this guy or anybody else from that for that matter. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5 makes it very clear about the hypocrites who judge other people. Verse 28. For I have five brethren, once again this is the rich man speaking. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. 
lest they also come into this place of torment, this place of sorrow. Once again, if you think if he was literally burning in a fiery flame, you think he could be holding this conversation? Of course not. He's just in grief, in sorrow. Verse 29, And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. They have God's word. That's why if you, you have the word of God, it's no excuse if you just forsake it. If you just say, oh, I don't need to study the Bible. Well, have you ever been taught the false Christ comes first? Because he's coming to perform miracles and, and by peace shall destroy many. Daniel chapter 8 verse 25. God told you, you had the word. There's no excuse for being deceived because you should have studied. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead... They will repent, verse 31, to complete. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he resurrected, he rose from the dead. Many people still choose to deny him. What a shame, what a tragedy. But how merciful is God that even if, the, even if they went the way of wickedness in the flesh, they go to that wrong side of the gulf. So they feel that torment so they, will, so they can be converted in the millennium. So they do not have to die the second death. So maybe you have a loved one or a family member. They died and they just didn't believe on Christ. Don't sweat it. They're suffering on the wrong side of the gulf right now, but hey, that's fine. Chances are they're going to be saved in the millennium. No one is sentenced to death of the soul right now except for Satan and the fallen angels. And once again, that's because of what they did in a spiritual body. When they had full recall, they were there with God. So that's how merciful God is. He gives every last opportunity but once again, if they still want to follow Satan at the end of that thousand years, we're done with them. That's what you understand. That's what this whole this, uh, earth age in the flesh where God put our souls in these flesh bodies. That's what it's all about to get rid of the truly evil ones. And so you may once again, make sure you get to that right side of the gulf by believing on Jesus Christ, by serving Jesus Christ. And I want to say one more time, do not ever let someone try to hold your past sins against you. They're erased. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says that, God, that if you confess your sins, God is faithful to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It doesn't say, oh, but I'm still holding this to your charge. No, it's erased. Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I, I am He that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will no more remember your sins. God erases them. And one more place, Isaiah 1.18, though, though your sins be red as scarlet, as crimson, they'll be white as snow. So just repent, be blessed, don't get yourself on a big guilt trip, but just when you sincerely ask for repentance, once again, true repentance, that means to think differently. I mean, you set it in your mind. You're not going to commit that sin anymore. And when you do, your sins are washed away and you're in good standing to get on that good side of the gulf. So you don't have to be spiritually dead for the thousand year teaching period and be taught. But if you study to show yourself approved and you stand against the false Christ, you will be a priest and reign with Christ through that thousand year teaching period. God tells us exactly what happens when our flesh body dies. Don't let it be a mystery. Study God's word and use this chapter to give others comfort. To let them know there is a chance. God gives every last opportunity for salvation. How comforting is our Father's word when you stick to it exactly as it's written. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the comfort and forgiveness that you give us. We thank you for sending your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and resurrect for us, Father. We thank you for giving us understanding about that gulf and for letting us know exactly what happens when our flesh body dies. We thank you for the millennium, for that opportunity that you will give when Jesus Christ returns. And we thank you for all your blessings and we ask you to continue to give us understanding not just for ourselves, so we can share with others. 
Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.